Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think like the first thing I might ask is one, one thing that is said <laughs> a bit in the server is just like do game design. And, um, this feels like a little bit, um, not that helpful. Sure. <laughs> so I think it'd be useful to kind of just like start there. Yeah. Like, what, what, what does that mean? Or just like, what is game design in general? Um, Etc. Like I have some thoughts, but I'll, yeah. I'll let you guys start. Sure. I mean, well, I would say broadly, game design is a practice, and a you know, uh, it's very general. It's it's a joke. The the do the do game design emoji uh, is, which I think is what you're referring to, is kind of a joke because it's so like, oh, okay, like step three, draw an owl, you know, type of type of joke. Uh, and so, yeah, it, it, it's very hard to do game design. And what does game design mean? Um, I think it's a broad thing. You know, I think historically I would have talked about rule set design as really being like essential to game design. Um, I still mostly think of it that way, but I think that plenty of people who maybe do broader things, level design, maybe even narrative design, um, things like that might still be engaging in game design. But um, I don't know if that answers your question or if I see if you have something to add. I was just going to say, I feel like game design is designing rules. Uh, you know, that feels pretty specific to me. And level design maybe is like an interesting thing to consider if it is game design, because you're creating content to, uh, you know, make the rules fun, but you're not exactly making rules. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, think, I mean, to me, game design, uh, for me, in my experience doing game design, content, rules, those kinds of things, a lot of times you're bouncing between them. There isn't a really hard rule between what's content and what's rules sometimes. Like, there's yeah, definitely some stuff that's on the line. Um, and I think that sometimes we make that delineation between content and rules for production purposes, you know, like, okay, you guys are making cards, you know, you guys are, are doing this and you guys are building the core system. Uh, but, you know, especially as a solo indie, a lot of times that stuff like bleeds together. Yeah. And sure. I just remembered in the Raf Coaster article I posted a little while ago, when is a clone? He talks about, a changing scalers like jump distance and etc and he considers that like a clone or a reskin and he calls changing levels kind of like under that same category so i guess depending on how much you consider like cloning or reskinning a game game design maybe change or like creating levels is a a similar type of thing yeah for sure i mean these are all pretty malleable terms i am definitely more leaning in the direction of having it be a little bit more open leaning you know like uh not fighting too much about what is and what isn't uh, game design, but you know, like you kind of know when you know when you see it. Um, yeah. Uh, Ey priest uh, mentions in the chat uh, the do game design meme is a good response to people saying you can't do X because of Y, and that I agree. That's more or less why I uh, why I liked it. It's like a lot of times in conversations we'll be talking about somebody will propose something and someone else will say, well, what about blank blank blank? You can't do you can't do that thing because of certain problems, right? And sure, that's true. And a lot of times though, in reality, the answer is, yeah, well, design your way out of that problem. Like that's what design is, is finding ways to achieve things that otherwise wouldn't be achievable. Like that there would be obstacles, um, you know, like I want to achieve X, but there is an obstacle in the way. Well, get, well design in general is the process of solving that problem and being able to achieve X even though there are obstacles in your way. That's one way of putting it, yeah. I hadn't really thought about it in that way. I think um, for me, like one of the one of the main things that I kind of think about, like what differentiates uh, like a designer from like an idea person is that it's, um, I mean, it's a different, different things. I think a lot of stuff about design is it's kind of um, like you are, like your design itself is kind of on a, um, it's like the local maxima, local minima, or, you know, where, where if you're just kind of like, <laughs> you have a design and you're just kind of like moving it around until it reaches like a local maxima and then like any small amount of change won't get it off of that. Um, you're kind of stuck there. Whereas I think with, with design, it's a lot about being able to, see i mean this is sounds similar to the 
you can't do X because of Y. That sounds like a local maxima type of problem, like mm -hmm. where you have some problem, any small change is like going to make it worse. Mm -hmm. So you kind of like need a bigger change to, to, to get around that. I don't know. Maybe I'm no, <laughs> misunderstanding yeah. the, the uh, thing, but yeah, that was kind of, um, I think part of it is definitely, you know, design is difficult because games, like the way people experience them, uh, I think like they say it's like a third order thing in MDA. Like as the designer, you're designing mechanics and the mechanics will become dynamics when people are actually playing the game and the player's response to the game will be informed by like, you know, like who they are and their worldview and their expectations and all that stuff. So like the experience that they're getting, it's tough to tell exactly what that'll be when you're just designing the rules. And I think it's just a given that uh, I don't know, you're gonna have to test your game to know for certain if a mechanic's good. Uh, there's probably like om only so far theory can take you. Yes. Sure. Yeah. For sure. I think one thing I would like push back a little bit on is I feel like a lot of, um, <laughs> I, I feel like a lot of the kind of rhetoric around game design, uh, just out there, not necessarily in the server, but out there is that you just try stuff like kind of randomly and then just see what works and then do that. And at that Probably point, there. it just, it's like, yeah, I think, I think you need some, you definitely need some testing, right. And, um, iteration, like, I'm not saying you don't need that, but that seems like you kind of want to try to minimize that to some extent, um, or maybe not minimize that. That's not the right word. I think it's, you want to be able to put the game in a better place where, like that testing is going to be multiplicative rather than just like you're going starting from zero and trying mm -hmm. to get somewhere. Um, but I think in, in premise, I, I agree. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the practice or the whole pursuit of game design theory is the idea that we can develop tools that can make it so that we can be more efficient in some way at doing design. Yeah. Um, yeah and I think um, there's something to that, you know, but also, creativity tends to be um, sort of bouncing back and forth between sort of more formal ways of thinking and more or informal ways of thinking. And, um, you know, yeah, uh, I think that I think that uh, creativity is, you know, we should we should definitely allow ourselves to just try stuff out and see what happens, you know, but also we should allow ourselves to jump into those sort of theoretical lenses um, and bounce back and forth between those. And I think that almost every game designer does that. Um, and they, I think that probably it's more about the way they talk about it that changes. Um, I would say, I, I think it's more the way they talk about it that's different rather than their process, but who knows? It's hard to know what other Certain. designers yeah. are really doing. You know what I mean? Yeah, I agree. Um, were there any other questions we wanted to like talk about in, in regards to this question or should we kind of move on to something else i think it's good we can move on if you're good right. ice yeah I, I think it's kind of interesting with design that uh you know you can end up with a game in a lot of different ways and i was just listening to the think like a game designer podcast and I forget who they were talking to but he recommended like for new game designers you could like you know make house rules or modifications to existing games uh to kind of like develop your senses on how to do game design you can uh take two types of games that exist already and mix them together and try to cut the mechanics that don't work as another way to like build your game design skills. So I feel like, uh, you know, the ultimate thing that, you know, th these all give you like a sense of how to do game design, but I think in order to be, I don't know what I would call maybe like a master game designer or something like how, how do you build up a rule set from scratch? Like without doing, uh, these types of things from different starting points. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good question. Um, Okay, so let me see. Maybe the next one we can go to is uh, actually kind of related to that a bit. Is sure. um, how <laughs> this this comes up a bit frequently now. I feel is um, like how specific versus uh, generalizable do you feel game design is? And I think that uh, I feel before you go into your answer. I think that we agree to a large degree, and then I think we come to different conclusions a little bit. So anyways, I'm interested to hear 
um, what your response is. First. I don't, I, I like some clarification. I'm not sure what you mean sure. by how specific sure. or generalizable it yeah. is. Yeah. Um, okay. So in the, in the past, um, you know, recently you, you've talked about how, um, you know, if you're trying to make a good RPG, it's going to be a lot different than if you're trying to make a good strategy game versus if you're trying to make a party game or whatever. Right. Sure. Um, or like even just like different genres, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of want to dig into that a little bit and find out, um, yeah, like, th does that kind of clarify, like, what I mean by, like, are there principles that, that apply across a lot of genres or even forms of games, or do you think it's... That that is not a useful approach. To, yeah, I think I think approach, yeah 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 I think I get you. I think that there are when you get down to sort of certain kind of elemental levels, there are probably mm -hmm. some things that are more likely to work than other things generally. And I think a lot of that has to do with like what is the popular common language of video games? Like what are people already acclimated to? What are they expecting? You know, what are the expectations? uh for for any video game uh regardless of genre um and i th and you know so uh i don't know like uh it would be pr pretty abstract things like you know in a first person shooter or any game that's first person if you have some kind of cursor you probably put that in the middle of the screen you know like um uh something like that uh or you know which button is jump and which button is run in a platformer um there are certainly conventions like that that are are, are uh worth considering yeah. um and and usually are worth following i mean there's a lot to be said for following conventions uh because it's basically yeah. free information that you don't have to teach the, the the person uh but yeah as to like broader design things i think there are things i think we haven't discovered a lot of them but there probably are things um but you know i think game design is really mysterious because you know the canvas that we're using is like the canvas of human agency you know so it's, it's very abstract and it also has a lot to do with like people and what they like and what they want to do with their time and so I definitely, I, 10 years ago, I would have told you that it's like, well, yeah, all systems sort of need to have kind of like a core of interactivity and, and, uh, I don't even know if I would have said all systems, but like that is a common, uh, thing is that you need like a core kind of mechanism or purpose and everything has to sort of flow around that. And having that sort of unitary model of design is going to, um, really, uh, make your game great regardless of genre. And I think now that that's, that's really not true. I mean, RPGs are a good example where that that's not the case. What I would ask, um, I think what I would ask is, mm -hmm. you know, what, what would be some examples maybe of some generalizations that would apply to any game, regardless of like their genre or their, you know, their form or whatever. Um, because I think there are such things. I don't have them at the ready. Like I don't. I'm not sure what they would be, but I think that probably such things are discoverable, and some of them we probably already know. But what it, do you have any in mind? We. I mean, like I think we could even just talk about um, like input output randomness as an example. Because um, I think here's the way I would describe like my take. It's it's. I don't. I don't think there's going to be like. Um, very many examples of a thing where you say, oh, in all in all games, no matter what, just always, you know, do this thing specifically. I think more of the way I kind of view it is that there's principles or these dynamics that can show up in a lot of different types of games. And if you can understand uh, the consequences of those dynamics, then like that is applicable in a lot of cases mm. because you know there might be certain genres where like if you understand input output randomness like you might be like oh i actually want output randomness here or um or i want input randomness uh, sure input randomness here or whatever right like that's i think the kind of conclusion i come to um it's less about this thing is good this thing is bad it's more right. like here are the characteristics of it um, totally Totally. Yeah. Actually, uh, along those lines, one of my favorite books, actually my favorite game design book, 
period is the one written by Isaac Shalev and Jeff Engelstein. Uh, uh, it's called like um, tabletop. Uh, Building blocks of tabletop game design. Thank you. Building blocks of uh, tabletop game design. That game, that book rocks, and it's a bunch of things. I would say not that unlike input and output randomness. In fact, I think it even talks about those. Um, and uh, it just goes through a bunch of like different board game mechanics, which I think are along those lines. And these are, I would say these are all like patterns and tools. Input and output randomness are also like existing patterns that are on a shelf that we've tried in various ways and that we can grab for. And it makes it a little bit easier for us to make, to try some stuff out. Right. And, uh, um, but it's not going to tell you like, you know, you should never have input randomness in any certain kind of game or, or output randomness for that matter. Um, uh, without being very, very prescriptive. Like I think, I think in both of my books, I probably talked about like how um, output randomness is not desirable in a strategy game. And by that, I was talking about a very specific kind of strategy game that's trying to achieve a pretty specific thing. And I think that the more specific you get, the more you can then start having those kinds of like, therefore you should not kinds of statements. Uh, sure. But in a practical game design practice, if you're actually making games, uh, you don't live in that universe. You're, you're kind of you're almost never, you know, you're almost always trying to like find some fun or you're trying to express some idea that you have. And, um, so you're not really, uh, confined in that way. So it's hard to have these kinds of like generalized rules. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I think in like in the general sense for an agreement. So, um, yeah, I don't know if, uh, Ice, did you have anything you wanted to add or any questions or also I, hello so hi sedge yeah hi oh we I, got also, that. I never know how to pronounce the name is it should i say sedge or, or, or uh so my name is seth and my uh, central is s, s my name is edward and my last name's happy so it's s-e-d-j is like my initials kind of i see okay so, so how do we say it though say central. should i just say seth or you can say seth or sedge or central Okay. How's it going, Seth? Good to see you. Uh, going around, right. I just happened to see you started talking, so I jumped in to just listen in. Listen in. Sounds good. Sounds good. You can also just, listen I if you want. If anyone wants, you can also listen on the Twitch chat, which is uh, happening live. But uh, you're welcome to talk talk as well and share your opinions. You're a very experienced game designer. Love to hear what you think about some of this. Sure thing. So far, I, I heard you talk about input and output randomness a little bit. It's always a fun topic. Yeah. I agree with uh, whoever was talking just now when they said um, it's not like one's good and one's bad. It's just like, yeah, as a designer, what do you want people to uh, kind of what kind of feeling do you want them to have about this part of the game? And then you can do that with, you know, do you do that with input randomness or maybe you do it with output randomness, depending on like if you don't want, if you don't want people to like not know how the things going to turn out, give them some output randomness. Um, and if you want people to be able to plan better, give them some input randomness. I, I, I agree with whatever. Yeah. Saying. I mean, I would say there are other considerations too, uh, oh, not sure. just those two, but those is a, that's a start. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like there's got to be some like very generalizable things though. Uh, in the same podcast I was listening to, he was talking about you know when he's designing rules, he tries to get them to fit on one page, and I feel like that's something that's maybe generalizable to any type of game. You want maybe you know not too few rules or mechanics, but also not too many, and I think maybe trying to dive into why that is, uh, you know, is useful for all game design. Who said that? Because I remember hearing something similar, like uh, you want as few rules as you can get away with or something like that. So this specific one is uh, Think Like a Game Designer podcast with Bruno ah. Faiduti. Uh, Bruno Faiduti, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a good podcast, by the way. A good interviewer, that guy. Uh, nice. The host of that podcast is a good interviewer. Sweet. A lot of good interviews. Bruno Faiduti is an old school Euro designer from France who's made a bunch of stuff, and he's very into player interaction. It's like he's a Euro game designer, kind of, but he like really likes player interaction and, and mind games. Yeah, I, I uh, what's he? I'm looking up I, because I know the name. I know I've played a few of his games, but I got oh Citadels. That was cool. I played yeah, that. Yeah, that's a big one. Yeah. Yep, that's probably his most famous game. Um, cool. Nice. Ad Astra, that's another famous one. That one's got, just came up in my mind recently because it's got a funny card that says if you get forty-two points, you win, irrespective of everyone else's score. Oh, There's interesting. A card that you can get that does that. Yeah. 
All right. So let's go on to the uh, let's, let's uh, E A Y Priest says I'd say that's pretty close to the idea of elegance, which I know uh, from uh, that Mark Water Rosewater talks about. Sure, and I've I've written about that as well. And I think David Serlin has a famous uh, not not famous, but like uh, I know the quote from David Serlin. It's like every time you add a word to a card, you have to like dr be willing to drive a nail through your hand or something like that, which is kind of a similar uh, similar um, concept. I think I would push that back on sense. the idea that, that you always want elegance. I think there are definitely cases where you specifically want, in, 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 you know, for lack in of elegance, a better term, yep. elegance, yeah. Totally. Um, I think in a lot of cases you want elegance, though. But I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that you always want it. I, I was going to ask, are there examples of where you would not want elegance? I'm really curious. Yeah. I think, I think an adventure game is, like, one of the things that comes to mind. Um, like... I, I don't know if a game that would be like heavily in the realm of strategy is where you want in elegance, but there's like plenty of other types of games where um, the player under, like, I think that the problem with it being in strategy games is that like, you can just lose and not understand why you lost. And it's like, Oh, I just didn't know that. Sure. Whereas like, there's a lot of other games where, you know, maybe you just want there to constantly be more stuff, like more content. Um, mm -hmm for lack of a better word, where, um, you know, that's just going to be inelegant, essentially. Um, but I don't think it's a bad thing. I think video games, I, in broadly speaking, like kind of w most of them, especially like one player ones, uh, which are oftentimes narrative, they kind of want at least certain kinds of inelegance. Um, and it's and I would say board games in general sort of want elegance because it's pretty painful learning a new board game um, and people don't really like to do it. And then people have to maintain the whole rule sets in their heads. And so you have to I think elegance is pretty valuable in board game design and it's less valuable in video games because computers can just handle stuff and a lot of them are one player and there's just a different sort of culture around uh, video games. Um, yeah, just as a general thought. I suspect that there are people, the people don't always agree or, uh, or have the same idea in mind as to the definitions of things like elegance. And I, to me, when someone says, sometimes you don't want elegance, I, I have a feeling they're thinking about something else that I'm thinking about, because in my mind, something that does, that does the same as something else, only more efficient, is elegant. And that's like always better. But I, uh, I, I, I admit and suspect that a lot of people either are thinking of a different way or there are a lot of people that like you know, having to um, sort of figure out what happens, you know, like, like if you're playing a game, I don't know, video game or board game probably, and there are some that are like, you try to do something and you have to like do some work to figure out the result of it or the, how it resolves, you know, what happens. And um, in, some, in some cases that might be very inelegant or inefficient way to do it, but the process of figuring it out, I think some people dig that. And maybe, I mean, whether that's because they like the process or whether that's because, um, it makes them feel smart because they um, maybe they they saw through that you know they they figured out the result of it before their friends did and therefore they made a good move or whatever, um, whatever the case may be. Obfuscating like what's going to happen as a result of my action. Um, uh, people sometimes I can see how that could be uh, a feature and not a bug, I guess. Whereas, um, I mean, sure, you don't want you know the result of the game to be calculable based on your one move, but maybe the result of the move itself, like. At some point, you should be able to see what happens as a result of your move. And then someone else just mentioned uh, losing and not knowing why, for example. But if you like say, I'm going to place my worker here, and you just don't know what happens after that, that's not elegant. And I can't think of a time when you'd want that. You know what I mean? Like, like sure. that's an extreme example. But I think if people are disagreeing on whether or not they want elegance in the game, I think they're, all, they're fundamentally disagreeing on what, what it means to be elegant. Mm. I mean, I, I think maybe what I'm talking about is is more about like that there's just a whole bunch of um, rules in the system that the player is not currently doesn't already know. Like mm -hmm. in chess, for instance, you basically know everything that can happen, like all the, the rules. But like anyone who's playing like a Magic the Gathering, like they don't know every single every single card that's gonna possibly show up. Um, it's certainly not casually or or in a sure you know, exactly. Crew. Um, I mean, that's even true with, like, video games, um, like League of Legends. But that's not or... elegant, though, right? No, Just exactly. So you don't know what... <laughs> no, but there's this value. That inelegance is valued in video games, I'm, I, in my opinion. Like, despite the... Like, you have accurately 
painted the picture of like, well, this does the same thing as the other thing, and we can just have one fewer thing. Why don't we get rid of this extra thing? And in video games, we want the extra thing a lot of the times because it's got a different pretty picture of a different character on it, or it's, you know, all kinds of different, or just to get another thing, you know? Um, there's all kinds of reasons uh, that we tend to want things despite, but I guess the question is, do you want the inelegance there? I, and I guess the answer is no, you're not specifically hunting for inelegance. It's more that you're you're wanting other things and you're willing yeah, to pay like the cost offs. of inelegance. Yeah. yeah. Can I play a other... devil's advocate here for this? Sure. Yeah, I feel like maybe inelegance in games, like for example, you said Keith Adventure Games is more of a crutch. I'm currently playing Signalis, which I think feels kind of like an adventure game. And the inelegance is in terms of like, you're going around doing different puzzles basically to push the game forward. And each puzzle is different and kind of its own game and not really connected to other games. And I would argue it's kind of just like creating new content to keep the player engaged uh, because I, I'm not like dissing the game developers, but as opposed to like, you know, creating maybe a more elegant system that could have been used everywhere. Uh, they had to make an, a bunch of different inelegant systems to keep people interested. Yeah, there's yep. definitely ways that like market uh, demands and, you know, business decisions interact with this conversation in a way that's not always like that's oftentimes kind of crappy. It just sort of sucks for the players and, you know, uh, or or it sucks for the designers too. Like a lot of times the designers themselves are like, you know, they're told by the bosses, like we have to make a hundred cards. Uh, we were promised this, you know, to the higher ups. So you just have to do it regardless of how many uh, would be best for the game. You know what I mean? I've been in that position. Sure. Yeah, I understand. Um, yeah, I think it's a little bit difficult to answer some of these questions where, you know, with the Magic the Gathering or League of Legends example where, you know, you could ask a question, would, would this game be better if it was more elegant? And um, I think that the answer probably is that in certain ways it would be better and in other ways it probably would be worse. And that kind of gets down to like game values. Um, to, I think that <laughs> that's where like a lot of these discussions kind of get to like just what is good or bad largely just comes down to game values and different people have different values. Um, yep. So. All right, what's your next question? Um, let me see. So, kind of answered this one already. Um, did we want to talk about um, the state of digital versus tabletop game design um, in general? Or does that sound interesting or not? Well, I, I think if you... If you have a specific question or thing to explore, um, it's a little better than... Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. so... Um, I mean, this is something that has come up a bit with, like... And I don't want to go into this rabbit hole right now, but, like, the discussions about coupling, where, uh, you know, it, it kind of feels like a lot of cases, a lot of digital games... Um, so, I guess some, some of the main differences between digital and tabletop games... Part of it is um, just like the what it is capable, what they're each capable of providing, um, and then the other thing is like more of a cultural thing, just where um, like a lot of tabletop game design is more focused on like more systems heavy game design sort of stuff, whereas that's a little bit less the case, I think, in, in digital games, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't know if there was... Oh, this was kind of a broad discussion topic. I didn't know if there was anything interesting to discuss here from your point of view. Because I, I know that you're... I mean, I, I'm trying to get into more of tabletop games. And I just played um, Daybreak yesterday. Um, but I didn't know... Yeah, I didn't know if you had any any thoughts on on this that you wanted to... That you thought would be useful to discuss um just because you have more experience in that regard than me well i definitely do have thoughts about it i mean i think um sometimes when we're learning game design like for me i'll just say my experience of learning about board games as a game designer was like extremely mind exploding because the kinds of things that um board game designers are even trying it's like they're operating on when we talk about mechanical board game design systems design sure. board game designers are just operating on another level 
you know, they're, 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 and they have been for 20 years. They've been uh, messing with like sort of the mechanics of interactivity in a way that video games designers just haven't been really. Um, uh, and that's not, you know, a fully a qualitative thing. I think that they, they do that at the cost of other things. But in any case, as a someone who really thinks about systems design a lot, board games were mind blowing for me. And I think, um, and I think every game designer should study board games, uh, even if you want to make video games. Um, but I also think that they are so fundamentally almost different. I don't know if fundamentally is the right word here, but like, you know, the, 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 the computer is a huge deal and the controller is a huge deal and the screen is a huge deal and a card is a huge deal, a physical paper card. Um, these things are all like really, really important. And the fact that um, with board games, they're sort of like, I would say board games are fundamentally multiplayer. Like most of the times that a board game comes out to be played, it is with two or more people. And video games are kind of fundamentally one player, you could almost say, maybe that's a stretch, but I would say the majority of video games are probably still played one player. Maybe I'm wrong about that. I know there's a lot of MMOs and um, online esporty kind of games and stuff, but I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it's to I me, mean, it What's that? Like a, yeah, I was just I was just gonna say at least by like the number of games, I would assume it's Oh yeah. Total number of games. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. And historically, you know, the the his certainly historically video games, you know, because a computer can kind of in in some ways be a player, you know, that you're playing with, even if it's a adventure game or whatever, the computer is like sort of like the DM or whatever. And so yeah, I think I do think they're very, very, very different from each other, and I've been noticing that more and more. The more that I like, so I've I've made I've made some board games, I've made some video games, and as time goes on, I, I realize more and more that like I I really want to design video games, and I, there's a bunch of reasons for that. But um, I used to think that they were kind of the same thing, and it doesn't really matter that like you know, you can apply the, because there are certain rules and stuff, especially again, if you're making strategy games, you can kind of apply a lot of the same rules uh, or the same guidelines to yourself as a designer. But um, as you, as you sort of broaden out and just look at like making board games or making video games, I think it's a really, really different thing. Uh, you know, something that's like kind of been, been blowing my mind a little bit recently is just how, how much of the value of video games is something like I press a button and a little man on screen moves in response to me pressing that button. And there's like such an inherent like joy in that, that I think even as adults, even as adults who know games very well, um, that's still operational. And that's like not really, there's a different whole thing that happens in board games. It's a little bit of a different aesthetic experiential thing. And that's just an example of like how, how different they are. Uh, the satisfaction of pressing a button, you know, or the satisfaction of shuffling a deck of cards or, you know, like an example I've given a lot is Monopoly. I'm not a fan of the board game Monopoly, but I think a lot of the satisfaction of Monopoly comes from uh, breaking bills. Like I, I said in my 2013 practice talk that like the core mechanism of Monopoly is kind of breaking bills because it's sort of fun to give someone change actually to like be like, oh, okay, give me a hundred and oh, okay, I give you uh, 20 and three fives or whatever, that kind of thing. And that's kind of the aesthetic fun to the extent that there is some, uh, that's a big chunk of it in Monopoly. Um, and yeah, those are some, some rantings on that topic. Cool. Ice, do you have any, um, I, I, I definitely agree with Keith. I think for the most part, I think board games kind of have to like try these bolder mechanical like things just because, you know, narrative, uh, audio, uh, visuals, you know, those aren't too big in board games. I know there are visuals and uh, people like pretty games, but it's definitely less of a big deal in a board game than a video game. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Wiz Wizbane says in the chat, uh, I always had trouble with the advice of making paper prototypes for video game design because that interactivity was missing. And I totally agree with that. Like I even, I even go further than that, that like, you know, sometimes you'll make a prototype and uh, some of the advice on prototypes is like, just make it without any graphics. But to me, it's like, it's not even an accurate test to see if the game works. If it has no graphics, if you just have squares and circles, because like you, you, I find in my experience that you actually need to draw a little picture of a little guy or else it's not going to be an accurate test of whether this is fun or not. Um, I don't sure. know if you have had that experience bricks at all. No, not yet. No, I, I, I agree for sure. I mean, even just, um, 
it, it's funny because uh, I was like reporting over um, the and like I had to like recode a lot of the um, the game I'm working on, Shutter Echoes, and um, there was there was a part where I didn't have any of the background in or anything, and like when I added the background, like that was basically I, I made some other changes, but like the main thing was I like, added the background. And it just like made it so much feel like so much more like oh this is the game yeah <laughs> people are just like oh this is just like a thing mm -hmm. um, yeah and music i mean music is something i constantly am going back and back and back and yeah everyone go wish, wish list shattered shattered echoes if you haven't already but um but yeah I, I i am always talking about music in games and like old you know nes games games like uh mega man and sonic and even mario you know like so much of the joy of those comes from the soundtracks and um that's something that like that's just not even a thing in board games at all yeah so sure. um you know you're you're just doing a very different it's a it's like sure the rule set design may have a lot in common like a you know like a good systems designer may be able to make a good mechanical board game and maybe able to make a good mechanical video game but the overall project of making of game design of making games uh you know for either is very very different yeah i'd agree uh, one other thing about video games versus board games, like Keith was talking about the joy of like feeling something on screen respond to your button press. I think like the game feel book goes a lot into that. And even though it's not like necessarily a game, like people just enjoy the, uh, uh, I don't know what's called like embodiment. Like, you know, if you're driving a car and the car responds to your inputs, there's like, yeah, a natural joy or fun in that, even though that's not necessarily a game in itself. Yeah. Okay, so it works well with games. Yeah. Um... All right, let me see. Um, <laughs> this seems like it would be a rabbit hole. Uh, did we want to talk about, um, like, just the state of jargon or, like, what we think it should be or, like, where it is versus where it should be? Um, like, that's a pretty broad topic, but I don't know if we wanted to go into that at all. Um, my, I, I mean, if you have more specific uh, thoughts, it might be good, but I just will quickly say that like in my experience, jargon tends to develop mostly within teams within one game project. Um, and then yeah. it's hard to then use that same jargon all the time later on. I do think there needs to be more sharing of game design, uh, stuff more, more sharing of information. I mean, one problem that we should talk about anytime we talk about game design theory, I think we should talk about intellectual property um uh protections stuff like ndas and stuff like that um i do think like this corporate you know it's a huge industry and the corporate uh controls over designers and what they can talk about with other designers is is definitely like a it puts a real hamper on the ability for things like jargon i think to to develop um sure. You know, uh, because like when designers, specifically designers, when they're in the, you know, in the muck of their knee deep in their designs, that's when they can't talk about it at all. And that's really kind of sucks. Um, yeah, I would agree. Yeah. I think that's that's one thing that um is not so obvious at first, because it's like it, it seems like, oh, you know, there's all these people like it, it feels like um I'm, I'm sure. And it's actually kind of funny because I guess Seth is left now, but um, both uh, Seth and I developed like very similar ideas about like I was calling it bundling and he called it entangled mechanics. And I think, I think even you, uh, there was a I don't know if it was a podcast or it was a stream. You mentioned something. I don't remember if you called it grouping, but it was also a pretty similar concept. And I think I've seen it other places. So it's it's just kind of interesting how. Um, there have definitely been cases, just even in my own experience that I've seen, where there's been like people reinventing the wheel over and over. Um, but a slightly different wheel, and, right? Like slight modifications. Yeah. Well, modification might be the right word because I think modification kind of like implies that like the one person knew about the other thing. And oh, sure. I think it's like a lot of cases where it's a very similar idea just being independently formulated. Um, and yeah, I don't know to what degree that happens. I, I assume to some degree, at least, um, based on my experience, but yeah. Um, well, I, I, I will, I do think that's a, that's a thing. There's reinvention of the wheel. I do think there's also like, you know, 
changing like it does kind of make sense to have sort of different jargon for different kinds of games um i'm thinking of other disciplines like music for example uh the way that um chords are thought about or, or written uh the, a lot of how you know how chords are talked about or upper extensions are talked about is different if you're talking about classical composition versus jazz composition and there are reasons for that you know like they, they have developed reasons for that but um so i don't think there's i don't think it's uh problematic for there to be multiple copies of different jargon terms out there that are serving different purposes. But but I do agree that, you know, it would be nice if we all knew about all the jargon and could kind yeah. of didn't have to reinvent the wheel so much. Yeah, that's that's kind of more what I'm good at. Like, I think yeah. um, like so much of like in order to progress in um, and I think this is probably get later on if we get to it um, in terms of like just developing theory. But I think in order to develop better theory, you ha need to have some framework to even talk about it because uh, I, I think this is the main pushback I would give to like there's I think there's a lot of people um, that can feel like uh, like terminology ends up being like this it just makes it like too academic or something and like on the one hand I kind of agree like I understand that but um, if you don't have a way like if you have some common thing that comes up over and over in, in like something you're thinking about and you have to just kind of like you don't have a way to talk about it other than just describe it each and every time like that's just not <laughs> that's not going to go anywhere um but yeah i think um i don't know i don't know if i was going to go anywhere with that um yeah, I mean, I, I, I think those are good thoughts. I, I do think that like when we have moments where there seems to be like a lot of agreement about terms, uh, just in, historically, I think like what you have is you have like a location or a place where a lot of these ideas can kind of like come together and then be sort of agreed upon socially. And I think the video games kind of like we have universities and, and things like this that, that could serve as that. But for whatever reason, um, I feel like that hasn't really yet happened. I feel like for a little while, like I sort of was imagining that GameDeveloper.com, which was formerly Game of Sutra, uh, a website like that could um, sort of be that kind of a hub. But right now what we have is everyone's got their own little island. You know, I was thinking really quickly about Richard Terrell, who did all this work yeah. defining uh, all these terms. And that's great. I love the work that he did, but there's also like a hundred other of those out there, I feel like, um, most of which I don't know about. I just, I, I'm pretty sure they exist because I've, I've seen a few of them. Um, and, uh, and so I think that everything is very segmented. Um, but, but at the same time, I think like, Maybe that's a natural way for culture to be. And, and this sometimes we have like a no, there needs to be like a top down, you know, prescriptive. Here's how it is kind of like a, an authority telling us, like, here are the terms for game design, you know. And I, I think that that can be useful in certain ways. It can also be harmful in certain ways. But uh, yeah, in general, there are um, it's maybe OK for there to be all these different little uh, d different little worlds that are disconnected and they sometimes crash into each other. And maybe that's all maybe that's all just how culture works in general. I don't know. Sure. Yeah, I mean, for what it's worth, I think, I mean, this, this is just my experience. I, I don't know if there's other places, but uh, in my experience, I think that this server is probably the most, um, it, it seems like it's the place, if, if you want to try to get into any sort of deeper game design discussion, it's a place to kind of have those discussions, because in a lot of places, uh, like, especially if it's like a big community or something, where there's just like a whole bunch of people, um, if you want to have any of these discussions, it's like, okay, well, you have like <laughs> some curriculum of like, okay, here are all like the concepts that I'm even like talking about. Like, if you don't even understand this stuff, then uh, I think I think that's part of the problem with um with it. And I don't know if there's a good solution. It's ha like a half joke, but uh, it feels like the only th way for like game design uh terminology to become real quote unquote is like if it shows up on gmtk <laughs> um or just like at least on youtube somewhere right like i feel like at least currently that that's kind of like the prerequisite prerequisite almost for uh anyone to at least have a chance at 
knowing what you're talking about. Um, Cause I think there's loads of terminology in books that no one ever uses. Um, so, or articles or whatever. Right. So, yeah, I mean, jargon exists or language exists in communities and so many online communities, quote unquote, aren't communities. They're too large or they have other issues, you know, and they just, the people don't know each other. And so I think that's, um, that is something I like about our community is it's like, it's a pretty good size. It's enough people where you can have a conversation, but there's not so many people that no one knows what anyone's talking about. And so, yeah, I think that, um, there's a communal aspect to, to jargon and a lot of things that we think of as they're supposed to be communities. But the thing that came to mind for me was uh, Reddit's uh, r slash game design, which I sort of tried to help kind of bring it together as a as a thing. I'm an admin on there and they have a discord as well. But it's it's really it's never um, it's never felt like a community to me. It's always felt like just a bunch of sort of random strangers strolling in like from a nowhere. Oh, uh, yeah. More like a convention. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. But um yeah, but but a convention that goes all year, all year round. If you imagine <laughs> that, what that would be like. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Did we want to move on to the next thing? Sure, let's do it. So this is kind of ties back into some earlier stuff. Um, what are like some thoughts on more concrete theory? Uh, so. Okay, so like the, the broad strokes of this question is like, uh, what are the thoughts on concrete versus abstract theory? And to clarify by that, I mean, um, like earlier you gave the example with, oh, you know, if you're making a FPS, you probably want to have the cursor in like the center of the screen, right? Mm -hmm. Like this is like a pretty concrete, I guess you could call it theory. Um, and um, whereas like more abstract stuff would be like input output randomness, right? Um, mm -hmm. Whereas a more concrete example of that might be, oh, you know, uh, it's like I have the fog of war or whatever, or I have mm. um, a dice roll, or like there's all these different ways that you can, um, concrete ways that you can apply abstract theory. But then the problem with abstract theory on its own is that it can be abstract, right? Like if you don't know any examples, um, it kind of has the issue that like a lot of Wikipedia definitions have, um, or maybe not it's Wikipedia, just like highly technical definitions. If you already understand the concept, you can read the definition and totally understand what it means. But if you don't already understand the concept, it's like you read it, it's like, what? Like, right. what is it even talking about? Sure. Um, so I think... Um, yeah, I, I guess I wanted to start with just like, what are your thoughts on um, those two things? And then there's some other stuff I'll go into, but let's just start there. Um, I don't have any thoughts immediately. Ice, do you have anything um, that you have that you want to say about that? Uh, the definitions feel kind of confusing. It sounds like concrete is just abstract with examples or, you know, examples of abstract mm. theory. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Yeah, okay, maybe, maybe I'll elaborate. Um, so one one thing I talk a lot about, or I mean not a lot about, but I like mention a lot is cargo cult game design. Um, but now also I want to, like there's what I'm going to call in, imitative game design. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the main difference I'm just, just drawing here is that both of these are um, basically copying something pretty specifically um, from other games. And I think the main difference is that just with Cargo Cult, it's like you're copying something, you don't understand why you're copying it, and it might not be a good fit. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, you know, if you have, um, th there are legitimate reasons you might want to copy some, like I imitate another thing. Like mm -hmm. the example, like a really simple example would be like putting the the cursor in the center of the screen in FPS, right? Sure. Like, you know, like, oh, I got to be unique. I'm going to put it off like, whatever right um, yeah so um i have some thoughts I, uh, from okay yeah. yeah i think cargo cult is a really interesting concept that um that is worth talking about um because like you could if you really kind of get down to it like i sort of feel that cargo cult is sometimes is sometimes like one of those things it's like it's only it's just like a, a way to insult things, but it doesn't really have a lot of 
uh, its own real meaning, because in some way you could say that we're all doing, especially with art, uh, anything creative sure. that humans like, you know, we're all doing cargo cult for some, to yeah, some extent, right? Like, do we really understand, like, if we really break down, like, why you really enjoy uh, jumping from platform to platform or any of the things that we do in video games? Like, yes, we have some explanations for it. Um, we don't know how much of those explanations are actually fully explaining the thing or and why, you know, our explanations do fail us to under explain why people like Mario, but don't like some shitty platformer, you know, like, um, uh, I don't know, or, or all kinds of examples, like our, our ability to explain things is, is very limited. And so I think that if we're being practical, like we're all, or being honest, we're all copying things. We're all doing the cargo cult stuff and not really understanding what we're doing to a, a good extent. Um, and so I think, you know, I think art, is largely you know a lot of it is mimicry and copying and and that's how and then we a lot of times we we modify and we tweak things and we change things and then we come up with explanations sometimes post hoc that are not necessarily the real reason why we did the thing that we did a lot of times we don't even understand why we made a change that we made fully sure. you know we might have an explanation maybe that is the explanation but maybe it's not and so um yeah i i think i i guess i'm i'm like less uh you know less concerned about uh cargo cult design or copying or these kinds of things i just i think that's part of the process and i, I think that ultimately it comes down to like what was the final what did what actually did the person produce like what did that what what's the game that they actually made and you know what they understood or didn't understand it's kind of like it's you're never going to know that really. And so it's 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 to me, it's more about like, what is the final product that that someone was able to make? And um, I do think but I don't want to overstate that either. I do because I do think that coming up with explanations is itself interesting and useful. And um, I don't want to overstate that. You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think I think I'm in agreement. Um, I don't I don't think there's anyone out there who, who doesn't engage in cargo cult to some degree um i think it's it's more of um i i think the, the main thing cargo cult is kind of getting at is it's where uh it, it's kind of a argument against the decisions that are made that is like i'm doing it this way because basically like oh because these are the ways it's supposed to be done as opposed to like thinking about why um like pick one from three sure um i mean it, it, it's a little bit of a di it's a little bit difficult to discuss because when you get into the stuff where you you might intentionally be copying something um you know I, like the two main reasons i can think of that that you might want to intentionally copy something one is because it it's easier to new players to understand just because it's intuitive quote unquote um because it's what they're used to right um another thing is just in communicating what your game is to someone who hasn't played it's just more of like a marketing thing right so if you have a if you have like a pick three screen in your trailer um it probably communicates oh this is probably a roguelike sort of game right um like whether or not you could do a pick three a totally different way um that there could be reasons why you might want to do that just for marketing reasons. Um, so there's lots of things to consider. Um, it's it's more of you're making a lot of times like really um, expensive design decisions early on, and I think it's it's worth thinking about. Is there a reason why you're making those decisions or not? Mm. Um, or if it, is it just because, oh, because games like this have always done it this way. Um, and I think it, it's difficult because there are a lot of cases where if um, you are doing stuff that is, like, there, there might be a good reason why things are the way they are, right? Um, like, if you remove the front row of pawns and chests, it's like, oh, let's just remove them or, like, replace them with, like, the powerful pieces. Then, like, there's, like, no defense or there's, like, uh like you just start like immediately start taking the other pieces on the board like right from the start and that's probably not going to be good for chess mm -hmm. um so you know 
it's, it's, it's a difficult discussion. Um, I think the main thing I was actually trying to get to was less of, um, so if cargo cult or imitative design is like more about like taking specific mechanics or specific systems, um, what I was trying to get more at is like, if you look at specific systems or if you understand the principles that, um, you know, and like you said, they're not gonna always be perfect. I mean, a lot of our theory is probably pretty far from perfect. Um, but if you understand principles, then you can kind of derive a whole bunch of different ways to um, create systems that that create that dynamic. Um, and those, a lot of those, could be like ones that aren't haven't been seen before, um, and they might be better suited to the the game you're trying to make based on whatever your, whatever game values you're trying to create, right? Yeah. Um, so I don't know if this makes the original question any more clear or not. Um, I guess maybe what I'm trying to ask is. I think what I'm trying to ask is a lot of times in, or okay, maybe not, wait, <laughs> in the past, um, a lot of times, like some specific examples from games will be brought up. Um, and I think a lot of times there's been pushback, particularly from you, um, about how they are like more, um, like they're too specific almost. Hmm. Um, so like I think that's kind of like they're, they're too concrete. It's like how like okay like I, I don't I don't know what to apply. It's like okay this game, um, I think this is kind of maybe what I'm trying to get at is like how you you talk about like there's a lot of descriptive stuff out there, right? Or like oh you know this game does this and then it doesn't and then it feels at the end it feels like okay well I didn't really learn anything about like mm. how to actually make games, right? Sure. Um, I think that's sort of what I'm trying to get at is where do you think there is a place for for that or so or part not? of or part like... of the reason why I wrote the books that I wrote were because I was finding that most of the theory that I was finding was yeah. very descriptive and was very like dictionary approach to game design. So it was almost more I, I saw it as almost more of like a cataloging or a, um, yeah, like um, a sort of cataloging type of process than what I was looking for, which was more of sort of a ground up kind of abstract um, theory. Um, and I think that, um, of course, there's a, I definitely think there's a place for descriptive theory for saying like a lot of games do this this way. You know, most of the book game design books I've read work that way. And I think that that's fine and great and interesting and helpful for designers. So I would say, that's great and keep those coming. But also I think it is good to have these kind of, um, you know, like uh, much more, uh, I guess, abstract, uh, maybe more pie in the sky, you know, less connected to the reality of what is and more um, aspirational, perhaps uh, more um, of an imagining of how games could be. Uh, I think that's really where, where I was coming from uh, more, you know, five, to 10 to 20 years ago, um, I was very alienated with video games in general. And um, I was I was very excited about imagining a completely different world of video games, like a completely, you know, let's start all over. What if we were to completely start over with video games? What would we do? Um, I think that that's a that's a very ambitious goal, uh, you know, because like that's just not how art works. It's not how creative things work. Art is part of culture. It's part of tradition. And there's going to be these social connections and this history and all that's going to inform everything that you're not, you don't get those. Like you can start over from scratch for one game and make a game that's sort of starting over from scratch, but a lot of people won't understand it. Like, you know, it, it will be perceived as alien and strange and it won't connect in the way probably that you want it to. Um, because games are social and, you know, there's the, the, the concepts of games are socially to some extent, socially constructed. No person has the ability to just prescribe the new laws of game design and then have everyone sort of 
understand those and and not just understand them but also like have fun in that way right like we're used to having fun by having mario jump on the platform and we're used to having fun by you know something comes on the screen and we click on it until it disappears like there's all these sort of patterns that we already have and we're used to having fun in those ways and is it, uh, yeah is it worth uh thinking about this separately from like maybe what would be generally successful or generally you know uh liked by most people versus uh maybe what you say like tastemakers like you know in like fashion and in music and in most art like the stuff that is cutting edge or like you know pushing things forward and maybe eventually becomes like popular later on down the line at first is like you know usually not palatable to the general population and it's usually like the people who understand the art forms that uh appreciate like the bold new things first uh, yeah i think a lot of times the 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 tastemaker things I think it's easy to understate how much they are still conforming to norms, even if like in a couple of ways they are striking out in new directions. I think probably, you know, broadly speaking, if we were to talk about a bunch of things that we would consider, you know, bold new visions for game design, they're probably maintaining a lot of the norms uh, actually at the same time. Right. And and because uh, that's that sort of allows them the 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 step step ladder kind of to do the the weird thing and and it's hard to i guess that's what i'm saying is like even if, even the bold things are still mostly conforming to to norms um but maybe you have some examples in mind uh that, that are not that way yeah i think there's still like some amount of conforming to the norm but maybe not as much as like you know other art that's in the field uh like i i don't know art very well for like painting but i'm thinking of like picasso as an example like what would a Picasso game look like uh, right now? Like going from the ultra realistic style of art to this completely new thing, uh, eschewing what people you know consider good art that looks realistic for art that doesn't look realistic at all. I'm not as familiar with Picasso's, the, the, the history surrounding Picasso, but my guess would be that there actually was already some art forms that Picasso was sort of pulling from and, and using as his basis and, and that he wasn't like completely doing something out of nowhere. Um, that's often the case. Like a lot of times we, we believe that there's a history is a certain way where there was some great man who came up with this brilliant like thing that struck out out of nowhere. And then we find out like, well, actually, you know, there was this little movement before that, that was kind of influencing that. And like, you know, it, things are, are oftentimes not as bold and different and out of nowhere as they, as we imagine them to be. Uh, but I can't speak to on Picasso specifically, nor can I tell you what the Picasso of uh, video game design would be. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't think it necessarily has to be the person who does something first. Uh, it's just the uh, people who, I guess, are keep trying stuff that is not successful. Uh, and of course, like someone like Picasso probably drew on, you know, painting theory before him, like uh, shape and form and color and contrast. Sure. Yeah, I think, um, I think maybe I probably should have, like, spent a little bit more time trying to formulate the question about abstract and, and uh, um, concrete stuff a little bit better. Um, I think I think maybe what I wanted to try to get to is or get at is I think that the the main thing between the two is that uh, abstract theory is if you understand it at the very least it can be a lot more powerful because it's uh, I think I've described it in, I have wrote up a post I was going to post on Reddit and then I never did. Um, it, it's kind of like, in an analogy, you have, um, if, if concrete theory is like a, a wrench, like abstract theory is more like an adjustable wrench. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, maybe this this wrench will work well if you just happen to be in the right context. But if you're not in that context, it doesn't really work that well. Um, sure. Whereas in abstracts, like it's just a, a greater context of like where you can apply it, um, and the, I think we're in agreement about like we want more abstract theory um, that we can apply in more general cases, um, or like you can use it to create the specifics, right? Like, this is this is kind of getting into like the same sort of thing as. Um, starting with theme versus starting with mechanics. And I think most mm. cases you, you're going to go back and forth a bit. 
Um, but like, if you if you start with the mechanics, you can have all this stuff, and they can f try to figure out like some theming around it. It's sort of the same idea there, except in this case, you're starting with like a general dynamic or or whatever. Like, oh, okay. Like you start with like, okay, this game needs some input randomness. What are some ways to do that? And there's like a whole bunch of different ways you could do that. And um, I think that's that's kind of like the, the strength of abstract theory. I think the thing about it is that I, I think you, you do need some, um, I think you need more concrete examples to start with, like before you can even get to um, the abstract theory, right? Like, I don't know if, if you would disagree about that. Um, I feel like if, if you try to jump straight to abstract theory, uh, maybe there's some cases where you can kind of just go from like first principles, I guess, to kind of uh, make a good argument. But I feel like in a lot of cases, you, you need to have, like you probably should have some examples in, in different scenarios of um, the abstract theory at play, essentially, mm -hmm. in order to say like, okay, like here, here are some things we can say about it. Um, I don't know if that clears up uh, any of like kind of what I was trying to get out more, or if that's still just confusing. Or no, I, I, I totally get you. I think uh, something I would add to that really quickly is just um, that in general with theory, that mm -hmm. you can have there's like two you know two poles, and on one hand you have stuff that's very broad and seems to apply to many many things, and I think that stuff tends to be less accurate. And then you, but but it also more applicable. So less accurate, more applicable. Uh, whereas the more specific stuff, which I think would be more in this concrete sort of uh, realm, is uh, more applicable. More, uh, sorry, less applicable. So if you can apply it to fewer things, but it's more accurate when you do apply it to those things. Um, so it's kind of like the one size fits all glove versus a glove that's like tailor made to your hand or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. And so so I do think there's always a trade off there and that probably I think that's across the board, like our abstract theory is never going to be as useful as useful in, in the like and as correct in a way as our specific concrete theory. Um, but I think it's still very worth um, pursuing. I just think it's worth keeping in mind as well that, you know, th that's we, in fact, I want that to be more of an invitation to make abstract theory. Don't be afraid to be wrong. Because like, yeah, it's gonna be messy. It's gonna, it's gonna have, it's not gonna apply in every case. You know what I mean? It's going to be, uh, it's gonna be missing a lot and it's gonna be wrong in a lot of cases, but that's sure. okay. You know, that's part of what abstract theory is. And um, so, yeah, I would say, take that as more of an invitation to do it than uh, something to ward you away from doing it, you know? Sure. I will say one of the pieces of, I don't know if this is considered abstract or concrete, but Raf Koster has advice where uh, when, you know, when you start designing your game of mechanics, you can start with a problem that is hard in math and like in general is hard for humans to solve because then at least you're guaranteed to have like, you know, some form of interesting decisions for players to make. Uh, and I found that like very useful in like thinking of like how to design games as a starting point. So I think I would like to see more of that. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good to me. Uh, do we want to do, like, if you have one more question, maybe, and then wrap up, uh, Bricks? Uh, we could do that. I had some other things to discuss, but um, the next one is, like, the the big one, right? It's, like, how do sure. we, how can we develop better uh, theory? Like, what are his, like, if we were talking to, like, a designer who's, like, I want to try to push game design forward. Like, how, what, what would you tell them to do? push game design forward i think it's good well one thing i would tell them to do and i think um tim kane's been putting out these videos these youtube videos uh every yeah. few days and i really appreciate that and he had one video recently where he's like why aren't there more channels like this and i think that's um that's a really good question and i think that's what i would say is like document your work like um let other people know what you're doing and what you're struggling with. And, you know, I, I do think like, yeah, write articles, you know, write little blog posts, um, make videos, um, share, talk with other people about stuff. Um, 
you know, especially indies have the capacity to do that because they don't have, they're not, you know, crushed under NDAs and whatever. Um, so, so a lot of game designers literally cannot do this. You know, last year when I had, I was working at a company uh, full time and I could not, I couldn't talk about what I was doing. Um, and, but if you, so I would say to all designers who want to advance game design theory, just write about what you're working on, write about what you're struggling with, write about the tools that you used already um, and how you use them and prescribe new tools. I mean, so many of my, like the triangle game design thing, uh, I'm forgetting exactly when that was really developed, but there was during the development, I think uh, it started as bad, way back as far as Oro, but it, it also went into uh, other games that I had designed and played. And so, you know, just just um if you want more game design theory just do game design theory like write up some stuff come propose some stuff don't be afraid to be wrong that's a big thing um just you know it, it's okay it's okay if it's wrong i think it's um i think we should think of game design theory as itself more of an art form you know um make some cool looking charts in illustrator you know what i mean it doesn't they don't have to be right um what we're doing is we are you're contributing in some small way even if like you're one percent right or something you're contributing in some small way to the the general social imagination of like how games work and um you're going to be echoing some things that other game designers have said thereby fortifying that message you're going to be you know pushing it back against other things so um i, th I think yeah you know the, the short answer is just just do it just make game design document your work Write blog posts, uh, get out there and talk to talk to other designers, um, you know, have have conversations like these. Um, go to GDC and 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 meet up and do meetups with people, you know, contact people on Twitter or whatever and be like, hey, can you meet for coffee at 1 p.m. on Tuesday and just sit down and talk about uh, game design that that all that stuff. The more of that stuff happens, the better for game design theory, in my opinion. Um. One thing I was actually surprised you didn't mention, I was kind of expecting you to on that question was um, one of the things you brought up, rec well, not recently, just kind of, um, I don't know, for a while now is uh, the whole like, um, like your game design, like your game itself is your article. Yes. Um, and I think, um, I think I agree with that. I think the the one thing I will say is that uh, I think there's a lot of cases where I think you, you kind of do almost need to have uh, what you're talking about, where like you're, you're talking about like, okay, well, why, why did you design it this way? Because uh, I think there's, for the most part, people um, just don't, don't see that. Like they, they see the end product. And I think it's kind of like if you are looking at a, like some really nicely sculpted sculpture or whatever and all you see is the end product and you don't know how they made it like you don't know what techniques they use to do it and i think um yeah i, I think it, it's 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 kind of difficult because like that's a, that's a big ask right um i mean it, it for people that are working in studios where they're under nda they can't and then for people that are like in an indie studio or or maybe solo or whatever right like like that's a big ask for them just because like it's already so much um True. but but yeah i think i think, I think there's obviously yeah go oh, on sorry i think like you know uh using your own game as like speaking for yourself there's mm -hmm. obviously like a limitation you only have so much time to make these games and analyze your own work and i think with all of this work that's also under nda you you can like look at other people's work and try to, you know, see past like what you're saying, the final product and try to look at what's there and really break it down. And even if you don't know how they got there, I think looking at what they have and like looking at the commonalities in other games and trying to build from there is also a good path forward. And especially for sure. someone maybe who like doesn't have the time to make their own game. Yeah, and like Game Maker's Toolkit, yeah. I think is like a really good uh, like way to like, you know, they're trying to push game design forward and they're doing it, you know, mostly by looking at other games, looking at, you know, common mechanics or things between these games and, you know, saying what's not, not saying what's good, but seeing what people liked and trying to like push things forward from there. Yeah. I think um, one thing you just said kind of reminded me of this is I think the, 
the main difficulty of of just saying like oh you know your game is your article is that a lot of times i think to a large degree um your uh game design for OS basically comes down to you doing that with a whole bunch of different games so like if your game is just like another one in that thing like i guess I guess maybe this is what, what this is getting to is there's there's no like one way to design a game, right? Like you can arrive at the same mechanic or system or whatever through like a whole bunch of different completely different perspectives. Yeah. Um so if you're just seeing the end product, right? Like you you might one person, one designer might be analyzing a game and then they realize, oh, you know, this works because of X. And another designer looks at it and they oh, this works because of why. Yep. Like maybe neither of them are wrong. Like they could sure. both be completely right. Um and uh, yeah. I'm I think thinking there's of, a lot of Yeah, go, go on. Uh I was thinking of vampire survivors, which uh, you mm-hmm. know, um uh I think uh Steven and I both talked about that game and how like for me, the thing that was like that I saw in that game that I sure. Uh, thought was brilliant and to, to me was like the thesis statement of the game in a way for a designer was it was a dual stick shooter which at least with the starting character you actually it's only a one stick shooter you don't pick your shooting direction and i have felt forever since we moved from like galaga slash gradius style movement to the dual stick you know, basically, since we had two sticks on controllers, um, I've always felt that that was too much control uh, in some way. That's hard to, for me to place it. Um, and so to me, like I, I read Vampire Survivors as very much like a, hey, one stick is actually kind of more interesting in a way, because then you have to position yourself in a way that, you know, like that your weapon will attack the enemy kind of like Zelda one has that same combat concept sure. uh, there where you, ha- you have only four directions and the, the sword comes out directly. So you have to get in front of something in order to attack it. Um, and, uh, and so to me, that was the, the major point, but Steven saw something very different in it about the meta game and the, or not the meta game, but the, like uh, the, the sort of set collection element of it. Um, and I think that's valid too, but yeah, I mean, I think it was, you know, vampire. And now again, vampire survivors. It's 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 like, I do think that that functions as a game design article in a way because there's it has these ideas in it. It does things in a certain way, and it it works, and it's actually very potent because it's very popular. And that's kind of the weird X factor is that um, popularity is required for it to really have any <laughs> effects on the knowledge of you know the 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 model of game design, how we think of game design. Um, I sure. also should say that like I probably overstate. The degree to which uh, fuckball and fuckballs, uh, Stephen is in the chat just uh, just cursing, cursing up a storm. Um, <laughs> Stephen, if you want to jump in and say something, um, I can go for another you know 10, 15 minutes or so. But but probably it's best to hit it, go and start fresh next week. Uh, but either way, it's totally cool with me. Uh, what was I going to say, though? We were just talking about you, Stephen. You said about uh, Vampire Survivors. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I was going to say one last thought on like your game. Your game is your design article is um, cool. Sounds good, Stephen. Uh, it's all good. Uh, we had we had a full compliment today, so it works out. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I overstate that because the thing is, I'm constantly documenting my work. I'm constantly writing articles and stuff like that. So for me, when I make a game, like it, it's it is a game design article very strongly. I think because I also document it and I also write about it and I talk about what I was thinking and you know I I kind of go into all that. So uh, and I sort of take that for granted. A lot of designers do not do that, um, yeah. and for very understandable reasons. Um, and so yeah, maybe it's not as much of a thing as as I thought. But I do think that like if you think of some popular games that came out in the last five years that and you know, that, that I think changed the course of game design, right? Like things like sure. Minecraft, things like, uh, some of the more popular roguelikes, um, Slay the Spire or, uh, you know, Spelunky, um, these things, I think all shifted the core, the, the way that game design went in a way that, um, I don't know if an article could have ever done that. I'm not sure. I don't think an article could have done that or a video for that matter. Uh, and so, um, sure. 
you know, like articles can be nice and clear, which is cool. And they can like state, they can be like, this is how it should be really nice and clear. Whereas games can't do that quite as much, uh, but they, they have this potency to actually make change in the way that an article or a, you know, a, the video does not have that potency, um, sure. that the way that a game does. So the, I think the best is make games and make articles. That's the way to go. Yeah. If you really want to make change. Sure. Yeah, no, I, I think I would agree with that. Um, big ass, but yeah, agree. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to remember if there's one other thing that I was going to say, but now I'm... Uh... Maybe we could uh, push game designers to, yeah, document their design process more. I feel like a lot of the times when I see postmortems, it's more like marketing related or uh, challenges with like scope creep and things, which, you know, I think that's useful, but I would love to see like more documentation on design process and how people arrive at their designs. Yeah, that's that's one of the things that's so weird is like there, there are a lot of interviews out there with designers, but like so 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 often it, it feels like <laughs> I don't know, it feels like you don't really get much out of it. It's just like, oh, I think you kind of made the joke about like, oh, you know, I can I can describe to you, you know, what those go like. It's like, oh, okay, we we tried some stuff. It didn't work. We changed it. And then it worked. <laughs> exactly. Well, <laughs> it's like, okay. Yeah. 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 So actually I see you said something about like self advertisement and that's another thing that, that is a major factor. I think here is that so many times, and that's also goes back to what we talked about earlier with, um, reinventing the wheel. Part of the reason to reinvent the wheel is so that you can market it as your own thing. <laughs> that you could right so that you can like brand it it can be part of your thing that you're like no 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 this is the this is the keith theory you know and and so you have to buy my thing in order to get the, this theory you know and so i think like the r that speaks to our society and how we're all like trying to fucking survive somehow and uh and so we're all pushed to reinvent wheels and you know claim our own little territory as opposed to be social and contribute to an existing community. Um, so I think that, um, you know, this, I think if we had UBI, I think we'd get a lot better or something like that. We'd probably have a lot better um, ability to not, you know, and that's, yeah, GDC talks. How many GDC talks are advertisements for something? Like <laughs> almost all of them are basically. And that really does hurt the, um, the capacity for, the, them to be interesting talks, number one, but them to be contributing to game design theory in a mean, meaningful way because they're, you know, if I was going to do a GDC talk, I would totally advertise for whatever my next game was was going to be. Like, you know, like I would, I would try to be interesting and I would try to like talk about game design theory, but I'd also try to get a lot of people like, you know, like subscribe to my whatever, Patreon or whatever, you know, and uh, because that's the world that we live in. And so we're all kind of, uh, everything is a little bit um, diluted by that, I think, also. Yeah, that's a shame. And I think there's, yeah, it's going to be difficult to work around that. Yeah. Um, there was one last thing, if we had a little bit of time left. Um, and I think this is a, maybe a little bit less of a question, but I'm curious if you had any like thoughts on it, um, was I think one of the things that kind of feels like i don't know if it's it's ever well i don't want to say it ever but like i don't think it's it's really brought up is i feel like a lot of times um theory kind of it, it feels like to other people that it's almost like oh you're you're moving like any creativity from it or or it's like it's like trying to make it into like a science or whatever mm -hmm. and like i i don't really like i understand how you, like why you might feel that way but like that I, I I don't I don't feel that way. I feel like um, what it's one of the things that's useful for is you know you're still like coming up with all these ideas or whatever. I think that the main strength of theory in a lot of cases is that it it can help you kind of, kind of constrain the space of where you're thinking about it, and also just in terms of like your vetting ideas on the spot, um, where you know if you have like you don't have time to try out everything, right? Yeah. Um, if you have like some sort of way to see an idea and think, okay, like by like my general tool set of like how I think about it, does it um, 
like what sort of things does it kind of like fall into uh does that seem promising i think that's i think that's like where it's like largely valuable yeah i don't know if, if either of you had any thoughts in regards to that i think you can definitely get good games with that you know imitative and cargo cult design and taking things and remixing but i do really think that like having a deeper understanding will let you do i don't know more powerful things or things that are different than what exists so that's why i really like your push for like you know thinking about this more deeply sure yeah i think yeah, um, I mean, go on oh i was just gonna say i think theory is not for everybody i think um uh there sure. are certain people who who when they learn theory i've seen this happen it, it's actually crushing to them it actually ruins their ability to make games i've seen i've seen that happen not just with all kinds of theory with art theory with music theory um and so i think that for those people i think theory can be kind of you know maybe it shouldn't be we could argue like oh they shouldn't be cr like they shouldn't interpret it that way and feel that way about it but they do and so i think that for some people they're much better off without theory and they're much better off just just having sort of a, a, a childlike approach or childlike sounds very infantilizing. I don't, I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, like a like a raw human uh, sort of approach to create creation. And and that's great. And I would encourage those people to do that. But I think that uh, for other people, um, yeah, like you say, like it's it can actually do the exact opposite and constrain the possible the, the options right in a way that's like oh my god it's so much more satisfying and easy to pick between these three possibilities you know or like this grid of four kinds of randomness you know as opposed to this like giant infinite rainbow of possibilities you know um yeah. so i think that's um that's a big thing and then the other thing i'll say about theory is uh for me um it, you know if i'm really being honest the biggest thing theory has done for me has been inspirational material every time i pick up a game design book like if i just i i seriously can't get through two or three pages and I'm like, shit, I got to go design a game right now. Like, I have an idea for a game right now, and I have to go write it down. Um, and so that's, you know, if I ever, I don't have this problem very often, but if I ever had the problem of, like, I don't know what to make next or whatever, like, game oh, yeah. design theory I've... books are fantastic for that. Yeah, I've got, like, a whole list of projects, but, but yeah. I, <laughs> it is it is fun to me when there are like people who ask about those types of questions because like it's just totally different type of person than myself yeah <laughs> yeah uh, i wonder I, how you get those types it's kind of interesting i was at a local uh game developer event and there was a game that was like it was very polished and had cool uh i don't want to say like core mechanics but like cool like game feel and like how things work but they didn't really know like what game they were making and it seemed like they could really use someone uh i don't know maybe like bricks who has like lots of ideas for like you know <laughs> where to take that type of thing yeah absolutely all right let me see i think i think that's pretty much i'm actually kind of surprised we got through all of this stuff um or pretty much anyways um was there any questions from chat or from either of you uh, Wizbane made a mention of uh, uh, Project Horseshoe, which I re regrettably is gone now. It disappeared. It, it, I think oh, during yeah. COVID, it it shut down, um, and I don't know that it's ever going to come back. But that was a that was a really good um, everyone getting together and like socially sort of trying to build theory together. Very cool. I went there one year, I think 2018 or 2019. Uh, it was great. Um, if there's ever things like that again, I think there probably are that I just don't know about. But um, or, you know, maybe someday I'll get a thing like that together. That'd be fun. Um, cool. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, the, for now, these kind of talks are are kind of similar. Um, so let's do this again. Um, I know we want to get Steven in here, so maybe next week we can get together again. Uh, similar time and and see if we can uh, do some stuff about coupling or whatever y'all want. Yeah. Lots of, I have a, I started making a list of um, some discussion things that I might be interested in making, but uh, also I'm sure that there's other discussion topics that um, Steven or other people would be interested in as well. So sweet. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's call it there. Uh, Bre Bricks, thank you for running this discussion and coming up with these questions. I really appreciate it. It was, I thought it went great. And uh, Ice, thanks for coming by. This was awesome. And yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for streaming this. Love talking game design. All right. Yeah. Well, we'll talk again soon. See ya.
Bye. See ya. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap this up. I'm gonna get into the uh, what's it called? I'm gonna down. I'm gonna put this up on YouTube and stuff like that. I also might stream like some game dev later on today. But um, thanks for coming by, everybody. And um, yeah, game design. A lot of stuff to think about. Uh, let's talk more about this in the chat. Uh, come over to the uh, Discord, and I'll see you there. All right. See you next time.